what was important was the message. What is their message? And what will that do? It will change the world one person at a time. Transported to the moon, and then there's a base. It's a lunar operation command. 我们在上期影片谈到汤普金斯，揭露了难以置信的秘密太空计划。而这里介绍一个叫科里古德的神奇人物，他正好能佐证汤普金斯的说法，而且他的经历更离奇绝伦。科里出生于1970年，从小就有直觉先知的天赋，因此成了秘密太空计划与外星人保持联络的特殊人才。据说他是一个星际种子。带有使命来到地球的宇宙灵魂，所以在六岁时就被一个神秘军组织招录培训。最后，他被派去地球之外的太空专案中服役二十年，期间与各种外星代表打交道，并经历诸多匪夷所思的事件。比如，他曾去过地球内部，到过月球基地指挥中心，去其他星球基地执行任务，经历了类北欧外星人的二十年回村技术等等。而最令人注目的就是他与蓝鸟人的接触，并受蓝鸟人之托出来说出真相，包括揭露阴谋集团内幕、秘密太空计划、地球浩劫以及刻不容缓的人类扬升计划等等。根据科里的揭露，人类在二战的时候就掌握了反重力技术，能造出飞船在太阳系飞行，并在太阳系中其他星球建有基地。它是隐藏在幕后的神秘组织——影子政府制造的，以致为什么还有阿波罗登月、国际空间站等，则是另外一派所谓的公开政府执行的。两方人马都互不咬嫌，甚至那公开政府都不知道幕后组织所做的事。所以，罗斯福总统曾说：“台面上政府的背后，有着一个看不见的影子政府。”在他们之上持续操控着，他们并不效忠国家，他们的所作所为承认了他们不对人民负责任。以下是科里在揭露宇宙节目中亲口说出其惊人秘密的精华。I'm your host David Wilcock, and I'm here with Corey Good. This is a very interesting conversation that we're having regarding the secret space program. So Corey, it's good to have you back again. And if you could really quickly give us an overview. Of your involvement with what this whole space program subject has been in your life. Okay. For me, it started at the age of six years old when I was brought into、uh, what is known as the My Lab. Some pronounce it Me Lab programs. I was I identified as a, an intuitive empath, and、uh, I was trained, and that was enhanced, and it was enhanced to the point to where I was around 12 or 13 years old. Me and a few of the people that I was training with being brought into a program to where we were what they called IE support for the Earth delegation, and this was a, a federation of a large amount of ET federations. There was a group of 40 human-looking ETs that were pretty much always present, and some of what was going on was going on telepathically. So we were just sitting there, and we were given this device that was a、uh, glass smart pad that's kind of like an iPad that、um, had access to the ET, basically database. And we were told to keep our minds occupied by looking through all this material. Towards the end of my training, it started to become pretty clear that I had done very well in the intuitive empath training. So it became very obvious that I was going to be. Interacting with non-terrestrials, and between the age of 16 and 17 years old, I turned 17 in February. I was taken from my room. I was then taken to Carswell Air Force Base. I was then transported to the moon. Where I transported from my house in the middle of the night by conventional means to Carswell Air, Carswell Air Force Base. Underneath Carswell Air Force Base, in a secret area of the base,、um, you. There's an elevator that takes you very far down, and、uh, many people know about the tram system that runs underneath the United States. I've and, heard insiders call it a sub shuttle. Yeah, it's a, a shuttle system. It's like a monorail going through a tube, and it's it, it's、uh, like a maglev and also in a,、uh, a vacuum tube. I was transported from there to another location, 
to where I was transported uh, to the LOC through uh, what some call uh, Stargate type technology or portal technology. Your website, something called LOC. Could you tell us what that is? The Lunar Operation Command is um, a facility on the backside of the moon. It's built in to, uh, in, into the craters and into the uh, rocky area to where it blends in somewhat. Some par part of it is built into the rock. Mm -hmm. Very little of it is above ground. Oh, okay. And spreads out as it goes down. And I've only had access to the upper levels. Mm -hmm. There are some people that are stationed there and work there, but it's more of a way station. People are coming and going from it all the time. To, so, go, to go to the further, uh, further out into um, the solar system and beyond uh, to, to go out to other stations, other bases. When approaching the moon from Earth in an electrogravitic craft, you will find the moon will be at a distance and then it will grow very quickly in front of you. And then the next thing you know, you are above the surface. You will then fly in the electrogravitic craft at breakneck speeds so that you don't feel inertia you find yourself hugging maybe 90 feet, 300 feet above the lunar surface, going at incredible speeds until you reach a crater. And then you find yourself orbiting a crater. The person piloting the craft radios in, requesting permission to land. You don't see anywhere to land. All of a sudden, a little ease kind of occurs, and then there's a base. It's a lunar operation command. And as you fly down and over, there is um, a control tower where they uh, control the air traffic. As you fly around this base to make your final approach, you see a secondary crater. And as you fly down into that crater, it's fairly deep, and you end up popping out into a lava tube section. You then fly in and land in the bay, and you're now at the Lunar Operation Command. If there are this many craft going to and from the LOC, and you say it's on the dark side of the moon, so couldn't people with their telescopes see all these ships coming and going from the moon? People do see that. There's actually another base on the back side of the moon that uh, belongs to human beings, uh, belongs to one of the secret space programs called Dark Fleet that a lot of people see craft coming from. It's, I can give more of a location of that one. If you're looking at the moon, it's at about the 10 o'clock position most of it is on the back. There are things, there are areas on the front side where um, craft come out and there are entrances. There are also areas that are uh, by ET groups that are covered by a sort of like hologram shielding that prevents us from being able to see it. When, when was the LOC actually built? The Lunar Operations Command is a moon base and it was built out originally by the Germans in the late 1930s, early 1940s. Um, while they were building this um, complex, they had utilized an ancient alien building that was not too terribly far away. They had found one of the buildings that they were able to patch up with some of the concrete they made from the local regolith. They then were able to pressurize it and use it as a base of operations while they built out the Lunar Operation Command. After a number of years and the LOC was handed over to the Americans. Once uh, the industrial might of the uh, United States became involved, they really started putting a lot into it and built it out like crazy. They started really building in earnest in the late 50s on it. If we had this all the way back in the 50s, then why did we do the Apollo missions? Why did we land on the moon? What was the point? There are various levels of programs. There are some in NASA, and there's NASA equivalent military programs that are what they think are the most cutting edge. And the people at each level are told they're at the top. Do you think that NASA knew anything interesting at all that we didn't know in the mainstream about the moon? They, there was a lot that was discovered during the Apollo missions. In the beginning, they discovered that it was not a real good idea to slam one of their landing modules into the moon to test the instruments they placed on the moon to, to check for moonquake. And um, from what I read, they were warned not to come back. If it's our moon, shouldn't it be our property and we get to have control over the moon? No. 
doesn't work that way? No. All these different regions are owned, pretty much owned and inhabited by different ET groups. And the, all of the different ETs, this includes human type ETs and the non-human types, types that do not particularly like each other very much. The, there's some sort of uh, diplomatic agreement about the moon. There's something very special about the moon being a very diplomatic, neutral zone. So you're none, saying, none of them will violate that. Not even the, the worst of them will violate. So real quickly, what is it like when you are in the LOC? Well, until recently, I had never been to the VIP area. I had always been to just the, the area to where they have yeah, small, uh, apart, kind of not really apartments, but small little dwellings where it has, you know, two to four bunks. How which, long were you at the LOC before you boarded the Mantacraft? It wasn't long at all. Uh, there was, uh, that's where I uh, signed papers, even though I was too young to legally sign legal papers. And uh, it was ex explained to me that I was doing a 20 year commitment. They called it the 20 and back. And um, I was then uh, put onto this uh, manta looking craft. Like and, a stingray shape? Yeah, like a stingray or a mantis, manta ray okay. uh, looking craft and uh, with a bunch of other people. And then we were uh, transported from the moon. Okay. And How uh, big is this Manta craft for conventional measurements? Uh, about 600 people could fly in it. Wow, so it's pretty large. Yeah, it flew us to our destination. What was the next thing that happened? Next thing that happened w was that I got to see the um, uh, research v uh, vessel that I was gonna be assigned to for the first time. How long were you on this space vessel for? I was assigned to the research vessel for six years. And you said that the whole term of service was 20 years? Yes. Uh, the intuitive empath skill set was needed in other programs. So I was moved through multiple programs for the remainder of the 20 years. Hmm. On your website, you've mentioned that there are five factions within the secret space program. Could you quickly delineate for us what those five factions are and just a little bit about what each one is like that makes them different from the others? Sure. Um, I'll, I'll start with the oldest, which is uh, Solar Warden. They were started back in the late 70s, 80s, during the uh, SDI, Strategic Defense Initiative, I think is what that stood for, during, uh, just before and after Reagan. And what was Solar Warden's original responsibility? They policed the uh, solar system from intruders and they were getting up getting upgrades up, up into the early 90s but they they were pretty much more of the aging mm -hmm. how does this relate to the alliance exactly okay. well that the they were kind of the root group that formed the alliance mm -hmm. um, you had uh, now they're made up of breakaway or defectors from the other space uh, fleet groups. And, you know, some of them are from uh, various black ops military space programs. Then uh, we have the ICC, the Interplanetary Corporate Conglomerate, representatives in a like super board, corporate board that uh, control the infrastructure, the secret space program infrastructure that they have out in space, which is massive. And uh, then you have the Dark Fleet. They are uh, a very secretive fleet that has very advanced technology. And uh, they are predominantly outside of the solar system all the time. As Solar Warden has started uh, a Cold War, uh, pretty much a, a Cold War, they, they started to like fly in front of the International Space Station to accidentally uh, show their vessels. Little things like that in the beginning. If Solar Warden is going to try to create exposure, where obviously the other parts of the space program don't want it, couldn't that lead to a shooting war between these factions? Yes. Yeah, it was, it was on the brink of that when um, the Sphere Alliance, the Sphere Game Alliance, um, went into an active mode and made contact with the Alliance, the Secret Space Program, program Alliance, which had just started 
accepting defectors from some of these other groups to where it just it wasn't just the solar working group anymore. The alliance was made up of defectors from the other programs as well. So it's a hodgepodge of all of, of defectors from all the space programs that have a common goal of ending the tyranny on Earth of basically the secret Earth government that controls the Babylonian money magic slave system and to bring to Earth the technologies that we have developed that has uh, free energy. These technologies would collapse the financial system and there would be no need for a financial system. And they want to bring this to Earth and to also do a full disclosure of all of the crimes against humanity that all of these elites have been doing. They opened up information to where those that were in the Alliance now had access to information. And this gave, seeing what was going on, gave them even more incentive to want to bring, bring it all, bring it all to men. Yeah, that's really incredible. You mentioned the term the Alliance a lot, and I think there might be some confusion there. There's the Earth Alliance. They have a completely different uh, agenda. Their agenda is uh, to, to basically create a new financial system and uh, to take down the cabal and, and, and a few other things in, in their agenda. And uh, then there's the Space Alliance. And it's made up of what started off with as mainly the Solar Warden faction and then defectors from the other secret space programs. And these defectors from the other space programs left their programs with their craft and intelligence and information and joined the Secret Space Program Alliance. And then we have this uh, Global Galactic League of Nations group that uh, was somewhat of a carrot that was offered to all the other nations to have them maintain this veil of secrecy about what was going on in uh, outer space. What's the sequence of events that led to you becoming a whistleblower? I was contacted by uh, actual uh, higher density ET group uh, that uh, has now been known as the uh, Blue Avians. Eight feet tall, um, they look uh, very bird-like. Uh, they're blue to indigo in color with feathers. Uh, when you say very bird-like though, are you saying they actually are birds with wings? and No wings. Um, they have uh, a very human-looking torso, arms, hands, So they're hominid. Feet. It's like a bird head on a human body? Uh, yes, but the, they don't have a long beak like a lot of people are trying to depict on the internet. It's kind of a, uh, it's a real soft, um, flexible uh, beak. And uh, they, as they speak, when they speak, they, they do a sign language or motion with one hand and then they, they move their mouth around and they communicate telepathically. So who are these Blue Avians? Where do they come from? Do they have an agenda? The Blue Avians told me that them and the uh, other beings that they are working with come from 6th through ninth density. Hmm. And that... And what is a density? Everything around us is made up of uh, matter, energy, thought. It's all made of vibration. So it's like another plane of existence. Right. And what is their agenda? What are they here for? They've been here for quite some time. They've been uh, observing, but they're here uh, for, um, there's, uh, we're moving into a part of the galaxy that is uh, a very um, high energetic uh, part of the galaxy uh, that's going to change the density of our solar system and our local star cluster. They are here uh, with these giant spheres to help diffuse these large tsunami energy waves that are entering our solar system and they're diffusing this energy to where we don't get too much at one time and to give us more time to prepare. If they didn't use these spheres, what, what did they say would happen? That uh, a lot of people would go mad and there'd be a lot of chaos. And is that something that they've told you or is that something that in the space program you had tangible evidence of? We had uh, tangible, tangible evidence of that in the space program uh, that's been studied for some time. 
but that's something they told me as well. Okay, and when, if we go into a different density, what are these blue avians telling you will happen to human life as we know it now? That we're going to go through a trans transformational experience that um, is going to change us on a uh, consciousness uh, level, mainly. What would that look like? Um, Do we become more psychic, more telepathic? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of, lot of theories. So are these blue avians looking out for our highest good, or do they have a hidden agenda? How do we know we can trust them? They're, they're definitely uh, of a positive polarity. Um, from what I understand of sixth and higher density uh, beings, they're not agenda-oriented as we try to project onto them. Uh, for our third, fourth density way of thinking Everything we do is agenda oriented. It's about making money. It's about uh, manipulating people to do or think the way we think. We can't project that onto a higher density being and say that they're going to be behaving or thinking the same way. They're a, a consciousness, higher vibratory, higher density type of being. They can change their location by consciousness, just by thinking it so. So you've actually had in-person meetings with these blue avians? Yes. My name was mentioned as a choice, as a delegate, to be a part of communications between this group, uh, the Secret Space Program Alliance Council. I was trying to talk my way out of this delegate position. I, I was giving these excuses after I had been brought to one of these massive spheres that are out in space. I, w I met this blue avian named Ra Tier Air walked up very close to me, put his hand on my forearm, and was communicating to me telepathically that I need to let go of all the negative and quit thinking about the negative. And his hand was very powder soft on my skin. It's the only time they physically touched me. And then he told me that what was important was the message. What is their message? Their message for humanity is that, and it's the tenet of many religions, is that we need to become more loving, we need to become forgiving of ourselves and forgiving of others, thus stopping the wheel of karma. We need to focus on becoming more service to others on a daily basis, and we need to focus on raising our vibration and our consciousness. Because they've chosen you as a messenger and Clearly, you're not an average guy. You have a connection to them that goes from before. The avian that I was talking to, Ra Tier Air, he informed me that I came from their soul group. There were wanderers and starseeds that were here on the earth that are here for a chosen reason. The number of people that are here right now that are here for a purpose is an astounding number. 80s, it was over 60 million or even more. I mean, the number of people that are here that are star seeds, that are wanderers, that have not awakened to that is a huge number. I'm not unique. I chose to come here during this lifetime for this purpose. They said that I needed to make sure that I, I didn't present myself as any type of guru or to let my ego get overdeveloped and to make it all about the message. They had, they had told me that three other times in history they had communicated with humans and they tried to warn us about decisions we were making and the dangers of nuclear energy and nuclear weapons and the route we were taking. Get rid of our nuclear weapons that the, the military people didn't like and uh, we um, unceremoniously sent them on their way. Turned out to what be did they claim we would have gained if we gave up nuclear weapons? Did they want some kind of disclosure? Yes, they, they wanted full disclosure. They wanted us, they were prepared to provide peaceful technologies, stated that we should focus, because of the vibratory changes that our solar system is going through, we should focus on raising our vibration and raising our consciousness. Still have some soul themselves? Yeah, everybody has a soul. We have our conscious self, we have our subconscious self and our higher self, until self drops off the equation and you just have the higher until it returns back to source. And source is where we all came from. They've told me that we're all one. We all come We all come from source. If somebody wants to make today a special day in their life, what could they do to make today that special day of helping? Make a little extra time today. Sit, find a quiet area, and even if you don't know how to meditate, meditating 
is just a, almost a form of even daydreaming. Sit there and focus on your mind and focus, focus your mind on, as long as you can at first, on positive loving thoughts and on how you can become more positive and more loving to the people around you and how you can become more service to others and more forgiving to yourself and others. And what will that do? It will change the world one person at a time. Well, that's great. Being yourself. 